Hi, and welcome to this episode of Hollywood Breaks. It's good to be with you today. Keith and I, in our episode, we're talking about the visionary need of studio leadership and what this world uh, of changing art, science, money, box office numbers, how we just keep score and what's really important in the Hollywood space. So enjoy the conversation and welcome to Hollywood Breaks. I read the, your newsletter and you drove to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania for President's Weekend. I did. Yes. Wait, um, so how far away is that, by the way? I know you're in Pennsylvania. That's Pennsylvania. So uh, it's an hour and a half, right? Two hour, two hour okay. drive. Not terrible. Um, straight on the turnpike for, and you know, for those of you who know Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania turnpike, the turnpike can occasionally be quite harrowing. <laughs> that could be two luckily hours. It's a, <laughs> luckily it's a part of the turnpike that isn't terrible. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we did that. And uh, basically what I was talking about in the newsletter this week, for those of you who didn't read it, um, was essentially we we went to the, the battlefield. First of all, I'm a little ashamed because I, I pride myself on knowing a lot of history and I had no concept. I guess because around here, a lot of the battlefields are more revolutionary war. So they're smaller than it's big, but Gettysburg, that battle took up the entire town, like no, including like the center miles. of town, <laughs> miles of like fields and it was, yeah. I was like, I got the map and I was like, oh my, we could spend like three days here. Yeah. Anyway, they have a beautiful visitor center there um, and it involves a film. It's like a 22 minute film called A New Birth of Freedom. And we went in and we sat down, we watched it. And as the lights went down, we were watching it. And I looked over at my kids and they were just transfixed. Like it, it just reminded me of sort of the power of movies and just being in a theater in a room where all the distraction is gone. You're not looking at your phone. You're not looking at your iPad. You're not pausing it to go to the bathroom to get popcorn or whatever. You're just transfixed. And it just, it, it just hit me like why I'm so passionate about the theatrical experience and why it needs to be preserved beyond just Spider-Man's and Star Wars. It really is amazing how like you could how much more in touch you are with a story when you can yes. see it moving on yes. screen too. Yeah. And that Gettysburg I mean, Center is really amazing. We, we, um, Connor, what was the name of that book that you guys read on our, when we went to Pennsylvania? To the the gods. What was it? Oh, Gods and Generals? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Katie was reading Gods and Generals to my, to my kids. Connor's one of them, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, um, still in high school, but she was reading it to them as we were traveling on the East Coast. Oh, wow. And she finished the book in Gettysburg on that bluff, looking down at the battlefield. And it's about, oh, yeah. you know, it's Gettysburg's one of the, one of the books inside there, but yeah. the, the book is about the battle or the, the people of the battle. And there they are. Yeah. I mean, I have a photo of them finishing the book as it, uh, that's right. Little round top. Little, so, little round top. Yeah. Uh, they were sitting on little round top, just just reading the rest of the book and the oh, imagery cool. in their mind. You could imagine they were imagining right what the battle. You could because yeah. it was a very vivid book. Yeah. Um. Not everyone gets that moment, so it's almost like your your kids had a similar experience where like they could capture the imagination, which is a really important part of yes. history, is to yeah. to relate to it. Yeah. Um, to reach out and touch it, to know that it's a real place in a real time. And yeah. almost like your epiphany the same way, you're mm -hmm. driving through the town and you're like, wait a second, it, like this Took is- up this whole these town. Are the, these are the buildings <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> it's like, it's not a, because, because you know, you can be separate and it's a story, but then when you're in, entrenched in where that story takes place, it's a very, very different way of touching it, huh? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we so had, was, um, oh God, sorry. No, I, I was it's gonna say it was I mentioned this in the newsletter, but it was like they were because they've they've heard so much the names Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, all these names. And and then when they actually saw someone, you know, I heard a voice that was supposed to be Abraham Lincoln, he, Sam Waterston, who's obviously a great actor and could really emote well enough to encapsulate what Lincoln may have sounded like. But it's still, it was just like, you know, just they were just taken by it. And usually they're a little fidgety or whatever. And, you know, my daughter's like, you know, rolling around or whatever, but they didn't move for 22 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it just, that's when it struck me. Like, this is why seeing something like this. And, you know, I call the newsletter, the power of moving pictures. And it's just, you see it 
and you hear so much about it, but when you actually see it visualized, and then, as you said, when we went to the actual battlefield, even for someone like me who loves history, just being there and imagining you're sitting on, you know, we drove by the point where General Meade first came a- across the Confederate cavalry, and you can imagine him standing there and watching all this 2000 strong army moving its way towards him. And he was like, wait, what? I wasn't yeah. expecting it to happen here. <laughs> right so there in the middle. Like you could see the yes. trough where yes. yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's nuts. And it actually really hits you. And unfortunately there are a lot of people who can't get to experience that. So the only other way you can experience this is through the power of movies. And mm. again, just the ability of being able to turn off any distractions and just focus your mind and everything on what's occurring in the screen. It just makes a huge difference. You just can't, you can't replicate it. It's just, it's just not. We had a, we had a very similar experience to that with my kids. We were, we went to the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor and we, it was a multi-day event. We uh, signed up at the symposium. My kids were 13, 11 and nine probably. Yeah. And then obviously the younger two. Yeah, five and three or something. Um, so then the first night in order to kind of kick off the event, there's a big kind of outdoor dinner group and you're out, you know, you're at the national park area. They're looking mm-hmm. at it. And then inside the theater, they played Torah, Torah, Torah. Now, oh, Torah, yeah. Torah, Torah was a film three and a half hours. It was actually a co-collaboration of Japanese filmmakers and American filmmakers recreating Fox the movie, events. by the way, it was a Fox. Oh, movie. that's right. It was a Fox movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, recreating the mm-hmm. historical events, trying to get it as close as possible to what actually happened. Although they admit that they excluded things from the film because people wouldn't believe it. it they're so mm-hmm. extreme and so unusual. They like, we got, we can't include some of these stories. Otherwise people will think the film is all fiction, <laughs> even though it's, to, it's the truth. But right. uh, to your point, when the, when we should probably have Connor Bond explain this better than me, but I'll, I'll tell you from my point of view, as we came out of the theater, now I have a 13, 11 and, 10, and nine year old or whatever, and we come out of the theater and the building across from you still has bullet holes in it from 19, uh, oh, 1944 or whatever, uh, 1841. Um, yeah. And you have the, you know, they're about ready to, for the next three days, go to these sites, different sites. Um, and you know, we're looking at the memorial, Oklahoma and Arizona memorials, the ships are still underwater, but there are ships oh, yeah. out ab- above water there. It's yeah. so different to like relate the events that you vividly see on the screen and then stand somewhere where you can almost smell <laughs> yeah. in, to, to the, the battle or whatever. It is mm-hmm. incredible. And you're, you're right. Filmmaking has that, it, but you know, on the other side and probably what we all appreciate is movies also transport us. That's why they're such a great way to have a dialogue is I can actually hear someone else's story that I can't actually relate. I, I, Mm -hmm. I don't live there. I don't speak that language. I don't have that cultural presence. I don't have, I, you know, it's a time I didn't, it's before I was born. Um, so that transporting part of it really, I think softens us and gives a better understanding of, of humanity or at least the possibility of humanity. Yeah. If it's um, exactly. maybe an Oliver Stone movie pushes your limits <laughs> a little bit more, but it is magical, a little bit. Right? Yeah. I mean, there were parts of JFK that I was like, okay, aside from the conspiracy nuttiness, but the actual feeling of what a lot of people went through in that those terrible few weeks in November and afterwards, you know, it's, it's, it's good to yeah. see that and understand the experience of what it was like then. I actually liked Nixon. I thought his Nixon film was so great because yeah, Nixon film was pretty a, good as a sympathetic character opposed to you know the villain yeah, that everybody yeah. sees him. As. I, mean, I guess it's appropriate <laughs> to call him a dick because he was. Hey, there you go. Yeah, his name was Dick Tricky Dick. Yeah, there you go. That's what I meant. <laughs> what did you mean by that? No. What? Um, no, never mind. <laughs> but up, up. We're here all week. Tip your waiters on your way yeah, out. Thank you very much. much. But there <laughs> is I, maybe that's what you and I kind of recognized and lament about the change of being just locked into your own living room and watching mm-hmm. a film. There is that kind of cultural touch point. And Kevin talked about that last week, like the importance of being in the room with other people watching a film is such an important part of the filmmaking process. Yes. It's not just to make content, 
publish it and have someone consume it as fast as possible. It's mm -hmm. the it's the cultural event and honestly recognizing how a theater works and making yeah. it a theatrical experience is just such such a different art form. Yeah, I, uh, the one the perfect example of this is Borat. For me anyway. So, I went to see Borat in a theater. I have never laughed so much in my entire I was crying and everyone in the theater was the same way. I watched it again by myself didn't laugh. now granted I kind of knew it was coming but I still I didn't laugh I chuckled but being in a theater where everyone in the theater is laughing hysterically you you're not going to you're not going to be able to capture that watching it on Netflix you just not it's just not going to happen and yeah I love the I, unexpected movie you just don't sometimes there's just movies you just don't know what to expect and you walk into a theater naively you're like whatever it's a movie I'm just going to go to a movie yeah and then the the audience helps you like solidify or make it relevant. If I was watching it on a plane, I probably would have slept through right. it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it's exactly yeah. right. It is I mean, I, fascinating. I, Go ahead. Another example I'd give you would be Titanic. So I went to saw that just because everyone was talking about it. But I didn't have any expectation of what it was going to be. Mm -hmm. But I just remember this moment when we were in the theater, it was packed. Titanic's ass is sticking up in the air. It's right after, you know, right when it's about to break in half. And you could have heard a pin drop in that theater. Mm -hmm. It was everyone in the entire theater was completely transfixed. And I, I never had a theater experience like that up to that point. And I was just like, this is amazing. Like I'm watching this and I, I, I was transfixed. It's like, holy shit. Like, yeah. that's yeah. a big ass sticking up in the air. And, <laughs> so we, it's and like, we know the ending and it's still- Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You already knew the ending and yet it's still transfixed people. And again, I, that's just not something you're going to be able to capture. It's just not. And I think it speaks to James Cameron's belief that that's the only way you're going to capture those kinds of, of feelings. And the fact that he is one of the few directors who has- I don't think we'll ever do anything for Netflix or Disney plus that isn't going to be in theaters first. Well, isn't it? I mean, I even find Disney struggles with that idea. Like we know that they can make their Marvel movies and mm -hmm. Star Wars has a moment. How many times did you see Star Wars as a kid in the theater? Cause there was no other way of Ooh, watching it. Uh, the only one I saw in the theater was return of the Jedi. Okay. Did you only see I, it once in the theater? Yes. Um, How many times did you see uh, Avatar in the theater? Uh, well, I worked on it too. Oh, so yes, that's so, never mind. I saw it a few times. That's not really a fair comparison. <laughs> How about Titanic? Did you go to multiple times to Titanic? I only saw it once in the theater. I wasn't, mm. um, yeah, I, I, I wasn't a repeat viewer, honestly, of a theater. I, I would, I was, I was like a dream for a studio. I would go see it in the theater and then I'd buy the DVD and watch oh, the right, DVD right. over and over and over and I over. I feel like I was, um, for those movies, I feel like, and others that I saw repeatedly, like you become an evangelist. So you're kind of telling mm -hmm. like, you know, Katie and I would go to the movie and we're like, that's really amazing. And then we would talk to our friends Tell other about people. it and we'd say, yeah. we'll, we'll go with you. You want to go again? Yeah. And then we'd go again. We'd go see yeah. it. So I think Titanic, I probably saw three times. Avatars, I saw, Avatar I saw twice because I wanted to see it in the 3D the experience 3D. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. well. Um, and well worth it. It was, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, but there mm -hmm. is, you know, like going back to the idea, like, so Disney has captured the theatrical experience with the Marvel universe and somewhat Star Wars, which wasn't their creation as, as much, right? That's, they yeah. just inherited that. Yeah. Um, but there are other films, you almost feel like they're not um, really making it happen. Aren't they? Are they going to cancel Beauty and the Beast? They're not well, going to yeah. make that thing. Right? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that are happening right now. And it's just it's an interesting because disney plus and disney in general have been sort of looked at as the gold standard of how we're going to navigate the next two or three years post pandemic but it's it's tough to say that that's actually accurate because they seem to struggle to your point yes they they announced that they're they're basically canceling the beauty and the beast they were going to do a, a a show based on gaston i believe and mm. they they kind of pull the plug citing you know budgetary issues creative differences but this is not the first time this has happened with disney they had a, a show based on the villains that was going to get made and then that kind of died on the vine they're having they're struggling 
with figuring out a way to capitalize on all this IP they have, right. aside from Marvel and Star Wars. And it, it's that's not a sustainable model. It's just not. And unfortunately, they seem to have made the decision to put all the Pixar movies <laughs> on Disney+. Plus. Which is unfortunate because those movies are fantastic to see in theaters with your kids and other families. And Pixar, rightfully so, has sort of been the gold standard in animation and, and storytelling, quite frankly, because they don't churn out 50 different movies every right. year. They make they a film out like one a movie film like, a film. Yeah. Yeah, like two or three years and they, they focus on it. And until Toy Stories came along, they weren't really big on sort of expanding the universe. They were telling original stories. Now we've got a sort of the prequel with, you know, Buzz Lightyear's movie. And so, I, I mean, I, it, it, it doesn't seem like they have figured out how to navigate. They're guessing just as much as everyone else is. And, you know, I think the fact that they haven't been able to figure that out yet is a, definitely a problem for them because, again, as I well, mentioned they can't earlier, really make it's a not universe. a sustainable I, business model. I feel like they're trying to like Cruella and Gaston or like, what other characters do they have in their traditional films? It'd be, yeah. I mean, I guess they can make 101 different films uh, following each of the Dalmatians. Like, right. okay, and then they grew up, They, would, but it's like, you can't make a universe <laughs> out of their original films, right? Right. But the again, Baloo movie is not going to be a great movie or whatever. <laughs> but again, it's it's what we what Tim talked about. It's this building the universe because the universe allows you to still use this original IP which is always what's going to attract audiences, but build upon it. And Star Wars has obviously been, a, for the most part, a very successful example of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the book of Boba Fett apparently did well, well for them. The Mandalorian, obviously great. They've got Obi-Wan Kenobi coming up, which everyone's excited about. It's, you know, so you can expand the universe. Now, granted, I think Star Wars lends itself to sort of a richer myth mythology than necessarily. Yeah, dude, people are writing books in the, yeah, I, I mean, have, yeah, I have there's Hans, all kinds Hans of different book characters. Book I made at Christmas, like in 1981, there's just, just yeah. random books that people are writing that have yeah. nothing to do with them. Canada so there's all kinds them. of different stories, different characters that have been created outside of what George Lucas immediately created. And then there's obviously Marvel, where you've got countless characters, although I, Marvel, you know, they have X-Men now. So, you know, who knows what they're going to do with that. So they've, they've got a plethora of avenues they can go, but it doesn't seem like Disney, the heart of like the Disney vault if you will has really figured out how to monetize that beyond just star wars and marvel and that's going to be a struggle for them because the demand they had a great quarter where they increased subs which when everyone was expecting it to be a little disappointing but now this pressure is going to be on because netflix had a rough quarter because i think a lot of the of the you know investors are starting to look for more concrete examples of success and you can't just flash like oh we're going to spend 25 billion on content over the next five years and then expect everyone to be like okay that's great well what's going to pop what's going to drive subs what's going to reduce churn mm -hmm. the sort of the idea that you can just say oh yeah it's netflix we can spend until time eternal but shouldn't we expect still... this the, some of that to drop off i mean when you're locked into your house for a year and a half because of pandemic yeah. right you take off the mask you go outside like you're you're not going to consume content as fast as possible some of the economy is changing. So right. some households are cutting back expenses. That all makes sense. So if I'm not, I haven't watched Hulu in three and a half months, why am I still paying the subscription fee mm -hmm. or whatever? Um, so I would, that doesn't seem like a surprise to me. I guess if you're Wall Street and you just, all you want is more and more money, even when it doesn't make sense, uh, you can blame it on a lack of vision, but like, let's hope it changes. You almost be like, yeah, let, let Netflix take a hit for a while and Disney take a hit for a while. I'd rather people outside or going into the theaters or, you know, mm -hmm. going to, uh, to the restaurants or whatever, whatever they need to do to become a real person in real life again. That's yeah, not and all it, bad. It, and it's interesting because you, you take the example of what formerly the company formerly known as CBS Viacom, which is now known as Paramount Global. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, uh, they changed their name. They doubled down on streaming and their stock took a 20% tank after all that. So in, in reality, if you look at what has happened over the last two plus years, they did everything they were, they, that, the, that it looked like the investors wanted. They rebranded, they doubled down on streaming, they started their own streaming service, 
they pushed the studio to start focusing on that to the point where they got rid of a, a legendary studio chieftain in Jim Giannopoulos and brought in somebody else who was going to push everything to streaming. And they were still like, meh. Like it just, it, it, it's, there's and no- CBS was a leader. CBS was a leader for years. The CBS All Access thing, like they're, it's been great. Yeah. I think that their shows or whatever, maybe the rebrand to take off of what was a primary brand to go to Paramount, what Paramount Global? That's possible because uh, Red, Sherry Redstone was the one who pushed the remerger. Um, and there is a lawsuit still pending, uh, I think in Delaware, of course, um, about um, well, all that, what uh, all, that, all that went down and how there are a lot of investors who were not happy about it and shareholders. And it's not talked about much, but mm -hmm. it's there's still a lot. You're right. It could it could absolutely be that because there's still a lot of people who are not happy that you took a brand like CBS that has a, a real brand. It does. Yeah. Like if you watch a show on a TV, you could be like, that's a CBS show. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's a show perfect for CBS. Because it's and, law and order. <laughs> yeah. everything and law and order, order, you're like, oh, that's NBC. <laughs> <laughs> CSI, you're like, oh CSI. yeah, that's CBS. Um, so it definitely could be that. That's actually a really good point. I didn't really think about that because CBS is an iconic band where Viacom, everyone's like me and Paramount. Yeah. Unfortunately, I've got a lot of good people that work and I know that work there. I wanted to succeed, but they've had some rocky years. So, I mean, it, it, it just, it, it, there, there's no tried and true way of moving forward, but um, it'll be interesting to see how the next, you know, few, few months and years roll out, given everything that's been it, happening. It's, over it the goes back to some of our comments of like the, the lack of the strong visionary, visionary at the yeah. helm of a studio, yeah. because you can exactly. understand it, you want it to be, or it's possibly a sign of the times that a broadcast network, an analog broadcast network is losing its relevancy and you have to mm -hmm. get to digital, you know, infinite platform. Uh, Cause that's the way the economy is consuming content right now. So the rebranding to remove CBS from that older kind of genre of, of broadcast into something that is linear, but or I'm just nonlinear, but the, Paramount name is not a visionary name. Like I don't think of leadership of Paramount and somebody that's making waves that's worth right. saying, even is the future, this is a better brand than mm -hmm. the one that's actually been the, I don't know, the foundation or the mark of broadcast television for at least the last 20 years. I, I feel like NBC had its heyday in the 90s and early 2000s, but CBS really has been the dominant force out there um it for has. so long and to, to erase yeah. that or not give credit to that name for a while that, that's it's kind of crazy like there is i think like i where, where's the vision i guess what is this yeah, what, what are there. we actually looking for <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i mean yeah. we talked about this a lot i mean it 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 you sit here and like i talk about how much i love movies and the theatrical experience and how important it is but i'm not i'm also somewhat of a realist in that if there isn't actual investment when we had dallas uh, sanye on about sort of i asked him specifically you know what, what do you think about the theaters and he's like I, I don't know how they survive unless they really take a hard look at how they're functioning because he's like listen if you come to like the middle of the country um the theaters are decrepit they're falling down like yeah you can go to la and you can have your choice or you go to new york and mm -hmm. you can have your choice of whether or not you want to lounge or you want to have a you know drink or eat dinner that's not what a vast majority of the movie going audience is experience right now. And until there's a moment when everyone's like, okay, we got to fix this problem. And then you ask, take aspects of what Kevin mentioned last week, which is like really drilling down to data to figure out what really can work for an audience and sort of, and you, you talk about this a lot in your, in your launch show launcher. It's like, it's the why, like nobody in Hollywood is asking that question. Nobody is asking that. If Steven yeah. Spielberg comes and says, I want to make this movie, nobody says, why? They're like, yeah. okay, here's 30 million, go make it. How and then much they're like, is oh, all the only question we ask oh, anymore. Yeah. Damn, how are we going to sell this to everybody? Like, and then it's like, oh, wait, we got to figure out how to tell the audience they want to see this. And it's like, it, there needs yeah. to be sort of a revolution on all accounts. And right now, there's nobody really fighting for it. I mean, you got Uncharted which, okay, 100 million or whatever it made over four days, you know, 50 million domestically over four days, I think it was, which five years ago, 
or even eight a year ago. Well, two <laughs> years ago. No, that two years like, ago. Yeah. Laughed off the and be like, what a what a tank. And now you got Tom Rothman sending out notes saying, Huzzah, we're amazing. And it's like, this is not how we're going to continue to evolve this business to the point where theaters are going to survive. Yeah, we kind of need to, to get out but, of the spin doctor realm of like yes, exactly. At, we made 25 million, we're huge. You're like, yes. 25 million is how much did you spin on the film? I right. mean, it may, what there is some credit to, like it is uncharted. It's not like it's is a big splash movie so um well it had a, it had a loyal has... audience it had a loyal audience because of the video game and yeah sure they mm -hmm. they would have gone to see it if you had put you and i in it just because it had uncharted on it probably not like because <laughs> people really wanted to see that they, they really want to see the movie I've but i don't know if we would have pulled it said, off Keith. i'm just I'm saying go no one's it. casting us i don't really like tom holland in that role but i want to see it because i've wanted to see a movie of this video game i played the video game when i was a kid i've wanted to see this for years so it didn't matter who was in the movie, but at the same time, you're right. We have to move beyond this because it, it seems like they're like trying to, well, there's certain segments of the trade press, which we can't really trust the word they say because they're basically in the service of the studios, but they are basically saying, this is a new world order. So a movie that makes 50 million over a four day weekend, two years ago, we would have said, this is a total disaster for Sony. Now we're saying it's a hit. Like it's, 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 it's just not going to work. Like, and yeah. no one is, no one is really calling it out and saying, this isn't, this is not, this, no, this is not a sustainable business model. It's just not, it, it, it isn't. There's no way that they're going to be able to sustain. They, I don't know what they actually spent on that movie, but I guarantee you they spent a lot because I saw spots everywhere. And when that well, happens, actually you know the their marketing team got healthy. to work. Which is yeah, good news, actually, by the way. <laughs> yeah, they actually got to sell a movie for the first time in two years. Well, this is awesome. There's a film. We can put it out there. Yeah, no, exactly. I, but I, anyway. I'm with you. Like, I think that the, the, the score has changed. We've covered that. We know mm -hmm. that the, the world has to kind of embrace a new way of engaging content, right? There's no the day and date model that's coming out here. But, you know, the the benchmarks that have been there if it's the box office numbers or even the oscar nominees or the oscar thing you know like the the way that we used to judge if the movie's relevant if it's if it's making its its splash or not maybe i you know me i'm kind of even saying like good red good riddance like if mm -hmm. it's just how much is that's all we're doing is was it big enough is it enough money instead of being that connection um and to listen to Kevin last week talk about what filmmakers are really looking for. And his job is to reflect back to them, be the mirror to say, is this movie doing what you wanted this movie to do in the, in the ears and the eyes of the person receiving it? Um, or did you just make a pile of crap looking for a pile of money? Either one, <laughs> like you have to know what you're doing. Um, so maybe there is some good riddance to some of those old numbers, but let's not be ashamed or try to spin that a $50 million box office is relevant to a two hundred million dollar box of t office two years ago. Like, right? No, call exactly. it out. Yeah. Call it out. Like, let's start making films for the purpose of fifty million dollar returns in the theater, but connects with the audience deeper. Or yeah. let's let's get some, some possible new IP on the planet that might have uni a universe appeal to it in the future. But let's recognize the long run over the just the short run little bit little hits. Um, yeah. Again, I think visionary leadership might be the answer to a lot of this stuff. If we could just find visionary leaders to run these studios, that would be great. It's just unfortunate. I, 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 I don't see anyone coming because the way this goes, it's much longer. We could do a whole podcast on this, but the industry itself is based almost in a sort of ent a, a apprenticeship type model where, you know, somebody comes up and you just learn how things are done and then you just apply them and then you just continue moving through the process and with any luck your boss gets noticed and then your boss kind of carries him up with you and and then it's just the process continues on and on and on and that's how you end up with the same four or five people running the studios for the last 30 years no wonder despite so the fact that the business has been ups and downs the audience has been dropping theaters are falling apart but hey let's just keep hiring and firing the same people over and over and over again and it's, it's just the nature of the beast. Like, I, you know, 
it was a big frustration for me and a lot of my colleagues at Fox because we wanted to try new things. We wanted to, to do different things, but there was a tried and true way of having sold a movie since time in memoriam, and this is how we're going to do it. It was the definition of insanity. But doing I'm going to say like that's why it probably was dis <clears throat> disrupted so easily because when an other, in another industry that could also broadcast something or distribute something, right? So mm -hmm. when um, the internet it caught up to the bandwidth to do that, why would you at all want an old model that's not being in there so easily disrupted, so easily disrupted yeah. that way? Yeah. Um, but it's not... But it doesn't mean that the people that we're concerned about, the filmmakers, the creatives, <coughs> the, the visionary builders that actually have a story to tell, still have a voice. We might have just shifted. We're, we're shifting the scorecard to how fast can you consume it? Um, how, how many can you make in, in, in release in one month? <clears throat> As if that's a relevant number to oppose to how many lives did you touch or how important was was this film when it comes well, down yeah, to I it? Mean Netflix has completely changed the conversation to from, you know, box office to them or people who see the movie to how many hour minutes mm -hmm. you spend watching it. How many films we're going to release every week? Yeah. And is, how many films yeah. are going to release in a year? <laughs> yeah. 80 at 50 or 80. I can't remember the ridiculous number, but still a brilliant commercial, by the way. We'll oh never God. Remember. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Yeah. But again, this, this, but let me, let me just make this point real quick. Cause I, I think it might've been missed when Tim was here. But that's my biggest problem is now everyone's going to try to copy that mm -hmm. rather than try to improve on it and make it better and elevate the game. They're just going to, they all have, you know, like Tim cap encapsulated the typical studio response to things like that, which is let's have a meeting, watch it. We need to do more stuff like this. How can we do like this? <laughs> Wrong conversation. It's like, how can we beat this? Yeah, that's the conversation. Now, maybe they had that conversation. If they did, kudos to them. But that's the conversation that needs to be had and hardly ever is had. It's all about, well, let's see if we can do what they did. It's like, why? why? Netflix has been eating our lunch for 10 years. Why are we mimicking what they're doing? We should beat them. Why did they be the first one to do it? Why if couldn't was, we do that? I just wish there was like a consultancy in Hollywood, like a vision crafting consultancy that's that brewing. could- <laughs> yeah, they would brew ideas. I just wish there was just a consultant. Yeah, that would help seriously. Studios where is that guy? Oh, oh wait, gosh. <laughs> he's right here. <laughs> if you're looking for it, visioncraftbrew.com. That's what you were looking for. Visioncraftbrew.com. Visioncraftbrew.com. <laughs> I'm told if you say it over and over again. And sign up for the newsletter. Founders sign up for the newsletter. The Founders Brew, which you can do on visioncraftbrew.com. <laughs> Don't miss the next episode of sponsored by Vision Craft Brew. Craft Brew. <laughs> uh, Hi, my friend. It is so good to pleasure, see you. Tim. Good Thank to see you, you again for bringing Kevin on. He was just of course. Brilliant. Yeah, I hope that we can have him back again. He's I, I would love to have him as a repeat guest because he's great. He's he's great, great conversationalist. And, you know, again, he really understands the industry in and out. Um, unlike few people do. And he sees it from all perspective, from the creative, from the filmmaker, the studio. Rarely do you have all of that encapsulated in one guest. So he nice. just, um, it's a, it's a unique voice in the industry. It's what this podcast is about too, is the introducing other parts of Hollywood because it, where else do you get exposure to it before exactly. you kind of get, get involved. So to yeah. know that that yeah. job exists, probably we, uh, people are listening, probably want that job and they're going to find another competitor. So if he comes out too far, people will be like, that's the great best job ever. I'm taking that guy. Well, I want that job. Totally. Yeah, exactly. But his sensitivity and understanding of the filmmaking process and to recognize the audience as a member of that process mm -hmm. is just, yeah. uh, uh, what a great perspective. So yeah. thanks for making that happen. Of We're course. looking forward to more guests. Who's coming up soon, Cammie? Uh, next week we have uh, Corey Nathan. Uh, Corey. For many oh. of you who are regular podcast listeners you will know that he is the host of trailer geeks and teaser gods so he has a very uh interesting insight into what what i used to do on a day-to-day -day basis and still do occasionally um, and a total and, fan he's a fan of that part of the industry oh he's a total he's, fan yeah. um he's also a creative entrepreneur he's got another podcast that covers politics politics and religion um and he's also you know helps with recruiting and he you know knows a lot of the same people and so it'll be a fascinating conversation. He's very excited. I had a pre-chat with him this earlier this week and he's very excited to come on. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of audience crossover because of um, 
trailer geeks and teaser gods. So yeah, they're great. I always uh, a great one. I always tag him when I post because I've been a fan of his for so long. I met him at a conference a few years ago. I've been a big fan of his. So sometimes I imagine, oh, we're talking about something really cool. He would love to hear it. So I just try to tag yeah. him to see if I get some response from. Um, well, oh, it works. Great. Yeah, love- <laughs> so he'll be here. <laughs> that's great. He'll be here next week. So tune in. That'll be a, that'll be a great conversation. Absolutely. All right, my friend. Well, have a great go. Enjoy the movie Uncharted with your family and have a yeah, wonderful no. weekend. <laughs> No but offense, Tom Holland, you keep making movies, buddy, but you're not a movie star. I'm sorry, man. It's not going to happen. But you seriously don't think Spider-Man's. Tom Holland's a movie star? No. Oh, come on. No. Yeah, yeah. What? Whoa, whoa, whoa. We, are we going to... Okay, we're going to... First of all, if no, anyone... I'm not going to... I'm not going to... Like, there is... The world has changed a little bit, right? So if you're talking about yeah. movie stars of, like, Tom Cruise level... Drew Barrymore. No, I don't think like he's anybody's... a movie star because I, I don't think people sit pay to see him in a movie. That That is a definition of a movie star in terms of driving sales. Nobody pays to see him in a movie. You don't think the $50 million that was come out from Uncharted, you think it's no. all because of a video game and not because I don't think of it's them. all because of a video game. No, I mean, I would say 90% of it's because of a video game. 10% yeah. is because nobody else had anything to do. Maybe you're five percent. You're going to eat your words. words in the next five years. You're going to see it because we're living I in will eat world. my words. <laughs> it's on recorded, and I yes. even talked about it in the newsletter. So it's all over the place. But I, unlike most people in this world, will show a little bit of humility and admit I was wrong. But yeah. at the point, the evidence points me to say Tom Holland is not a movie star. Okay, we'll see. I think we'll he see. has very universal appeal. I think he's learning how to navigate. I'm sorry, when the, he when the, the clip was showing, and he's behind the bar. I'm like. Where's the ABC to arrest this teenager serving drinks? No, it's not going to work. I'm telling you. He's perfect for Spider-Man. All right, we'll see. All right. Besides that, have a good weekend. Yeah, you too. (laughs) See you next week. See you next week.